I just want to give a testimony about something that happened a couple of days ago. I'm at work. <clears throat> um, and one morning, it was me and my, my trainee. And Comcast gave me a job that was for somebody else. And went to the job, and the guy, he was already there. So I told him, well, don't worry about it. You know, I'm going to call him and just tell him to give you back the job. Since you're already here, you've already been working on it. So... The whole time he was at the job, he was um, staring at the lady who lived there like he was just staring at her real hard. So um, me and my trainee left, and the next morning at work, he asked me if I was looking at her. I said, no. He was like, man, she was fine. She was this. I was like, okay, I wasn't looking at her. I said, you shouldn't be either because that's your sister. And... He was like, no, that's not my sister. And there, there was a guy who was behind him. He was like, hey, man, because that, that is your sister. And he, and he went on to say, well, you know, God gave us eyes to look and stuff like that. I said, no, God did not give you eyes to lust. And he was like, well, she was, she was a beautiful woman, so I was just admiring her beauty. I said, no, what you were doing, you were lusting. Because any time you stand at a, at a female for about four minutes to... Ten minutes, you know, that's, that's pure lust. No matter how long you're looking at it, if you're looking at her to lust, then it's lust, period. And um, it, was about, it was about 20 people in there at the time, and people were commenting, joining in and stuff, and, um, and he went on to say, well, you know, um, nobody's perfect and, and, and stuff like that. And then the guy who trained me, like I want to say seven or nine months ago, he, he said, well, you know, we all have fall short and came short of God's glory and stuff like that. And I told him that's not what that means. And, um, and after that, um, I went outside and I came back inside to let him know a dream that God gave me for something that, um, that I did. And I told him um, the dream. And when I told him the dream, you know, people were still commenting and still joking around, pretty much like trying to make fun of me. And I really felt weird about the whole situation. And um, they, they were still defending their, their thing of, well, you know, God gave me eyes to look. I'm a man. I'm human, you know, and stuff like that. So I left it alone. And with all that being said, um, I got fired from the company about nine months ago. And the guy who fired me, he was there, and I didn't know. And I'm sitting here saying all the stuff about God, and he's there, and I didn't even know. And um, so I come back inside with my stuff, and the guy who I was talking to the first time, he pulled me to the side, and he told me that he thanks me for, for me telling him what I told him because he knew that he was wrong, but he, he was just saying that, that it's good to actually hear somebody, you know, say something and, you know, basically stand up to the situation. And he told me, don't, don't ever change that. And I told him, I said, that, that this is a lifestyle. I'm, you know, I'm living, I'm living this lifestyle for Christ, you know. And for, the, um, for the, the guy who fired me, he was in the office. And like I said, I didn't know he was there. So um, I go in the office, and I tell him my name. And like just to look on his face, he, he already knew who I was. And... I was excited to finally meet him, which um, I didn't, you know, bring up the whole fire or anything. I was just um, excited to meet him because I wanted him to actually see me for me and not from a picture on a badge. So um, with that being said, I was, I was excited because he was able to, to see me for who I am and not a picture on a badge. And um, the, the next time something comes up saying that I, either I did something or something happened that, that was affiliated with me, that he can actually know who I am and know what spirit I have within me. And, and that he can't, you know, just toss it off to the side. Like, okay, well, he's just another person. So, and that's the testimony that I have. That, that the brother, he actually received the correction. And for the other guys, they, um, there, there were a couple of them who didn't say anything. And I feel as though that, that they took it into consideration. And there was a couple of guys who completely just blasphemed about it. Like, they really didn't care. But the brother who, was, who, who it was for, he actually received it. Even, I mean, even after all that, he received it. So, that's testimony. I want to greet you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're glad that everyone is here that's here tonight. Those that are listening in and those that are watching us live 
and those that will see this message on TV or hear it on the radio, however you may get this message, we're grateful that the Lord have touched your heart to uh, to be here to or to hear this message. And yeah, I pray that when you listen to these messages, that you will that the Lord will allow you to see uh, what He wants you to see in it, and that you will learn from these things that God uh, have to say to us. Amen. I pray that you were blessed by the testimony and uh, uh, the lesson there. I think that is very important that um, we as believers take a stand for what God uh, for what God stands for, and not just think, well, because I'm on the job, I better not say anything or whatever the case may be. Uh, we have a right to live our faith. We have a right to let people know that this is a lifestyle. This isn't just something that we put on Sundays, you know, and things like that. That this is a lifestyle that we live. And we never know who we may help, you see. We never know who we may help. You see that? Um, Stephen, when he was being stoned, he might not have known that one day Saul was going to be there. And that Saul was going to learn from that stoning he might not have knew that but you know when we when we look at and when we pay attention to um, that just that story that there was Saul a man who hated Jesus Christ with a passion and was ready to kill everybody who stood for Jesus Christ ready to kill them you know it's, it wasn't like it is today where we have women prisons they didn't have prisons for women back then but he was throwing women in prison and there was Stephen. We see him in the book of Acts getting ordained as a deacon. And then the Bible says that God did work, mighty works through his hands. And then we see that he stood up, you know, and, and began to preach to the people and tell them, you know, tell them the story of Jesus Christ and Moses and how, you know, that they were stiff-necked and hard-hearted just like the people in Moses' day were and things like that. And there was Saul who we've come to call Paul, there he was holding the coats of the people, consenting unto Stephen's death, consenting for them to kill him, and basically egging them on. He was really the ringleader. You see that? He was playing the, the, he was playing the, the job of the enemy. You know, the devil uh, don't hardly do anything. He gets other people to do it for him, those that are willing to submit themselves to him. You see that? And so there was Stephen being stoned and if you if you could just picture in your mind and I, I try every time I tell this story to get you to see the picture of what was going on there was a deacon there preaching the Word of God to those people and I don't know how far away from, from him they all were but at some point they all ran up on him and began to bite on him not just one so if you got more than two or three people biting, they got to find areas and make room for that. Now these are church folks biting on a man who's preaching the gospel, biting on him. And at some point they began to stone him. And there was Saul consenting unto his death. And Stephen began to pray for those people and asking the Lord not to charge it to them. And that, of course, you, if you notice a couple of chapters later, you'll see that Saul, you know how it is when people do evil, they, they, after they've accomplished one thing, they're they more pumped up to do more. And so Saul is going to Damascus to, to kill more and to, to persecute more Christians. And on his way there, the Lord get his attention and say, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who art thou that I should persecute you? And he said, I am Jesus. And he said, it is hard for you to kick against the prick. That was the Lord's way of saying it's hard for you to go against your conscience. Now, this is what I always say. I don't expect people to always receive what's being said right up front. I don't always expect that. Some people, they'll receive it right away. But I, I don't always expect people to receive, it, to receive it right up front. But you know, once it's said, it's in your ears, it's in your mind, you have to deal with it now. You see that? And my job as a minister is to present the gospel to you, not to convince you of it, to present it to you. The Holy Spirit takes it from there. You see that? And he's the one, he knocks on the heart 
uh, the door of your heart to, to tell you, hey, you remember what was said? Are you following this? And so that's what we do as believers. We live our life in front of people. You see that? We live our life in front of people so that they'll have an understanding of God's word. And, and they'll know, you see, they'll know what to follow. You know, you'd be surprised, the people who, many of you, you know, you know certain things about the Bible that other people may not know. And you'd be surprised the things that you take for granted as far as your knowledge and what you know. Uh, you'd be surprised the things that other people just don't know. They just have no idea, you see. And so it's our job to not be ashamed of this gospel, but to live it. That's what Paul meant when he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. I'm not ashamed of this gospel. Now, that, that don't mean just speaking it, but that means also living it. I'm not ashamed of it. You see that? And God does not want us to be a, ashamed of this gospel. I always say, you know, the world lets you know who, who's, what God they're serving every day. And I think Christians have gotten relaxed and we just kind of bend down and just, you know, just kind of take it. But, you know, it's time for us to stand up and, and, and share the gospel with people. And I don't mean doing it in a mean spirit or a bad spirit. Just sharing it with people, you see. It, you never know who it may help. Amen. All right. So last week, we started talking about death and how God wants us to understand death. And uh, again, <laughs> it's one of those things, you know, I've, I, when speaking on this subject before, uh, actually, you know, just talking with different people at different times about it, I've had people tell me, well, Brother Bowden, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to, let's not, let's talk, that's just dark. Let's talk about good things. <laughs> but to the believer, death is not a bad thing. That's the way you're going to go meet the Lord unless he just translates you like he did Enoch and Elijah. You see that. But death is not a bad thing. And God wants us to understand death. Uh, death is, if it's something that God allows in, even in his believers' lives, then, it, you know, he, he wants us to understand it. The word of God makes it clear that Jesus Christ took the sting out of death. He took the sting out of it. I remember years ago when I was living in Louisiana, I was doing some yard work, and uh, I think I had my shirt off, and uh, I was stung in the back by three wasps. Now, if you've ever been stung, especially stung in the back, you know that that's, that's extra. And that's a mean wasp, see. <laughs> and so, I mean, it, it was... It was felt really, really bad. And I remember thinking, man, it's been years since I've been stung by anything. And so uh, I, I was feeling so bad, I thought, I'm going to have to stop this work just for a little bit until I start feeling better. And so I went in the house, and somewhere in between that point and going in the house, the Lord spoke to me and told me uh, to just pray. Just pray the pain away. Just tell the pain to leave. And that's what I did. I commanded the pain to leave, and it left no quicker than I got it out of my mouth, and I went on back outside and began to went on back outside and began finishing the yard work that I was doing. And so the the Lord Jesus Christ, in His mercy, He took that the pain of it away, and that's what that He done the same thing with death. He took the sting of death away. You see that He took it away from us as believers, so that we don't we don't feel the sting of it. Uh, years ago when 9-11 uh, happened, of course, I had a friend, a personal friend, a good friend of mine who was killed on that day as well. Uh, he and I were in the Navy together, and uh, at the time he was working in the Pentagon. And um, so th that's where he was killed at, there. And so, you know, and I, I thought about those people, all of those people who were on those planes, who flew into those buildings, and those people who were in those buildings as well. And I began to think, Lord have mercy, all of those people at one time leaving this earth like that and the Lord spoke to me because I, and I you know many of us it's one of those events we can remember where we were when we heard the news of that and uh, I began to think Lord have mercy all of those people have left like that you know that what a horrible death that is to die to just be on a plane thinking you're going to someplace 
and next thing you know, you're being flown into a building. Like, you don't even have time to think about dying, really, when something like that happens, if it's all of a sudden. And so I, I just began to think that way, and the Lord spoke to me and said, my people, before they feel that, I take them. Everybody understand? Before they see death, I take them. Does everybody understand what that means? And you may say, well, Brother Bowden, let's show me that in words. So let's go there. Let's go to the book of Acts. Uh, the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. I wasn't intending on going here tonight, but I guess this is a, a direction that the Lord is leading us in. Seventh chapter of the book of Acts. We're going to start reading at verse 51. Now, this is kind of the, along the, the same story that we just got finished going over with Stephen and uh, him preaching, um, him preaching to these people. We'll start reading at verse 51. He says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Now, this is the Sanhedrin, the religious people that he's talking to, and governmental people that he's talking to. You see that? So he's telling it like it is. You're stiff-necked. You're hard-hearted. And hard of hearing. He said, you always resist the Holy Ghost. The same as your fathers did. You see that? So I think it's important there, w what you see there, when you resist a preacher, you, who are you really resisting if the Holy Spirit is speaking through him? You're resisting the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's go ahead and keep reading. It says, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Can you imagine? This is still fresh. The Lord has just went back to heaven. So this is just still fresh, you know. And, and they know God's law concerning killing an innocent man. They know that. And they're basically, he's basically telling them, you've killed the Messiah. Spent all of these years looking for him, and then when he get here, you kill him. So you, you see the tone there? You see, you see that? Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 53, who have received the law by the dis disposition of angels and have not kept it? You see that? Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to where? And they gnashed on him with their what? We're not talking about babies and toddlers. We're talking about grown folks. <laughs> All right, let's go and keep reading. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and did what? These, this aren't children. These are grown folks. And you may think, well, Brother Bowden, that's really silly that grown folks act that way. But that's the way they act when they come to church. Uh, they may not be doing that naturally so, but spiritually that's what's going on. You see that. All right, let's go and keep reading. Verse 57, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran up on him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was who? Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down. And cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, what did he do? He Everybody see that? He did not die from being stoned. Even though he was being stoned, the Lord took him before he felt the sting of death. Everybody see that? The Lord took him before he...
felt the sting of death. And that's that. So the Lord wants us to understand death. It's not something that God put out there to be mean. That's the way you're going to see him. You see that? That's the way you're going to meet him if you are, if you are a, a believer. So last week, we talked about what death was. And so we, if you go to the book of Genesis, you'll see there where God created man in his image and in his likeness. And then the Bible says that he formed man out of the dust of the ground. And what did he do after he formed him? He breathed into him. And when he breathed into him, what happened? Then he became a living soul. So if that's how we receive life by God breathing into us, then the opposite is true for death. He takes that spirit away from us. You know, people say all the time, and this is a good, good uh, place to put this here. People say all the time, the, the Bible says, so let me ask this, what is the breath of God? That spirit, that's the breath of God. And so people say all the time, the Bible says, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. And they say that thinking everything that's breathing is supposed to praise the Lord. Naturally so. That's not talking about folks just walking around that's got, you know, uh, just breathing in and out because they got lungs. That breath is talking about the Spirit of God. Everybody understand? The Bible says God desires us to worship him in spirit and in truth. That means with his breath on the inside of us. Not the natural oxygen that's talking about his spirit. You see that? And so we see here that here Stephen gave up the ghost. So that's what it, that's what it caused death in the Bible, giving up the ghost. If you remember Jesus Christ on the cross, he said, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. What else did he say before he went to the cross? He said, no man takes my life, I lay it down. Everybody understand that? He said, no man can take my life. Now let's think about something. In the beginning, and this is what we have to start at, in the beginning, it was not, we were not created to die. We were not created to die. That's why death hurts us so much. When a loved one dies, it's not natural to us to say goodbye to them. It's not natural to see them laying up stiff and cold like that. You see that? And it's definitely not natural to see them go into the ground. That's, that's not natural at all. It's something on the inside of us that know we were supposed to live forever in this earth. But when we disobeyed God, everything got turned upside down. Everything got turned upside down. And so death entered in. You see that? So it's something on the inside of us that knows that. That we were supposed to live forever. You see, and so here in the beginning, when God created us, he created us to live forever. And then when we sinned, he told us in the day that we would do that, what he commanded us not to do, dying we should die, is what, how that literally reads. If you go and look at the Hebrew version of that in the book of Genesis, you'll see that word die there twice. So God did not lie when he said, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. What he was saying was, dying, you shall die. In other words, from the, from the day that you do that, your body will start to deteriorate. And in that day, you're going to die, spiritually speaking. You're going to die, spiritually speaking. So, this is something that the Lord had gave me, and I imagine this is for somebody, since we're here. What opened the eyes of Adam and Eve when they ate of that tree? What, what opened their eyes? Let me, well, let me ask, I've already given the answer. What opened their eyes? Disobedience. Doing what God told them not to do. And so when they opened their eyes, what did they, when they disobeyed and catered to the flesh, what was it that their eyes were open to? Their nakedness. They saw things naturally. And so from that day forward, now before, before they sinned, before they disobeyed God, they saw things through God's eyes. They were pure. They, that's why the Lord could come down and walk with them in the cool of the evening. They, they were able to handle it spiritually so. They were not limited the way that they, we're limited today. 
And so when they disobeyed God, their, the Bible says their eyes were open. Now, somebody that's not saved might think that, that was, that's a good thing. But listen, on the other side of that is faith. When we disobeyed God in the garden, we began to walk by sight. So obedience to God now blinds you to this world and what you see naturally and allows you to see again what God intended for you to see to begin with. So you're no longer walking by sight. You walk by faith. And you close. Now you see why the devil have all of these natural things flooding you with it day after day, just eating that stuff up. Because he wants you to continue in the path that Adam and Eve started, seeing things naturally. You see that? But when we obey God, now we walk by faith. It's just like walking around with your eyes closed. You trust in God now. You see that? You trust in God. And so, the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis that as, you know, after the fall, that mankind began to be more wicked. Let's, in fact, let's go there. Let's go to the book of Genesis, um, the sixth chapter. The sixth chapter of the book of Genesis, and uh, we're going to start reading. At verse 1, it says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. That was the first time God set a time parameter on life. A hundred and twenty years was the time that he had given us to live in this earth. He said, my spirit is not going to always, it seems like the longer I let a man live, the more unrighteousness he does. So from this point on, his, his time frame is going to be 120 years. You see that? 120 years. So with that, let's go uh, real quick to, hmm, let's go to the third chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. All right, uh, we're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Everybody see that? So don't ever ask the Lord, why am I going through this? Why me? Ask the Lord, what's the purpose of you going through it? In other words, what, what does he want you to learn from it? Not why me, you know, ask the Lord what he wants you to learn from it. If you truly belong to the Lord, there's a reason why he allows you to go through things. The, the Lord don't, everything, look at what that says, verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every what? Purpose. So God is not just sitting up there just allowing you to go through things for nothing. There's a reason for it. There's a purpose for it. And you know why? You're still going through it? Exactly. You, you just ain't learned. And ain't really thinking about asking about it. You're just praying, Lord, hurry up and let this season be over with. 
Why? So you can go to the next one and the devil kick your butt? No. You, you need to learn what God wants you to learn this time around. You know, when I, I started school when I was three, and I graduated when I was 17. And that was on purpose. I could not ever see myself failing a grade. I just, I, I didn't really like school. And I was trying to get through it as fast as I could, with as less work as I could. So, you know, I was naturally intelligent, but I was just one of those people, I was just going to do just the minimum to get by. Just let me get on through. You see that? And I could not see myself spending another year doing the same thing I had done the previous year. And then having to get to know some new faces. And them know, weren't you a grade ahead of us last year? I didn't want to be that one. So I just got on through school and, and got on out of there. And I guess I'm the same way in my spiritual life. I want to learn what I'm supposed to learn this year. So that I can graduate and go to the next year and go to the next lesson. I want to learn what I'm supposed to learn right now so that I don't keep taking the same lesson and keep failing it and not even knowing I'm taking a test. You see that? And God don't always, God is one of those type, he, he give you pop quizzes. You'll be taking a test and not knowing it. You see that? Until you've been convicted by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you see. <laughs> and so, I, I was just one of those, I just wanted to just get on through. And that's why I am in my spiritual walk. I want to learn the lesson that God has for me to learn right now. Not just continue, you know, making the same mistakes over and over again. Alright, so let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 2. It says, a time to be born and a time to what? And I write that lets you know. If people don't complain about being born. But they'll complain about death and, and try to avoid it. You see that? It says, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. So this right here lets us know that same God that have set a time for you to be born. Which everybody in here, everybody that's alive, was born. And so just like you can accept your birth, the Lord wants you to know there's a day of reckoning coming. Well, where you will die if he doesn't come back before then. And so the question is, are you going to be ready when he get here? Because he's coming. And you may say, well, Brother Bolton, there's still got some events that's got to take place before the Lord. No, it's not. No, it ain't. Don't let the devil fool you with that one. It's not that the Lord don't want you to know what day and time you're living in. But we're not guaranteed to leave this building tonight. You see that? Uh, my great uncle, years ago, you heard me say this before. My great uncle asked my old pastor, Reverend Beasley. said, uh, Pastor Beasley, when is the end of the world going to come? When do you think it's going to come? Like what time frame? And he said, well, I don't know that. Because it's not given to us to know. He says, but when you breathe your last breath, that's the end of your world. That's what you need to be concerned about. That's the end of the world as you know it. You see that? And so there is a time to die. And so everybody that is born, God set the date for you to be born on the day that you were born. That's not a mistake. It doesn't matter how you got here, whether mom and daddy were married, when you were born, it doesn't matter. If you're here, you're here because God wanted you to be here. So I, I want you to think about it on two ends here. You got the, the time of birth, and then you have a time of death. And there's just like there's a time to be born, there's a time to die. The question is, what are you doing in between those two times? Now, what we're going to cover tonight is this. There are several factors. Now, God, the day you were born, or before you were born, I should put it that way. Before time even began, God set a day for you to be born. Just like he told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. 
So if he know you before you before mom and daddy know each other, then he also has to know what day he has for you to leave here. And, and let me say this, he's not evil in it. That life belongs to him to begin with. I, I, my mother tells me when uh, my grandfather was um, sick and looked like he was about to leave here, she said she was praying, Lord, please don't take my daddy. That's what my mother was saying. Lord, please don't take my daddy. Now, he was already an older man and things like that. And she said she was just praying that prayer. Lord, please don't take my daddy. You know, please let him live longer. And she said the Lord spoke to her and said, if I let him live a thousand years, it still wouldn't be enough for you. Still wouldn't be enough. I'll give him a thousand more years. If you live that long, you'll still be praying it when it's time for him to, me to take him. Lord, please don't take him. And you may have heard me say before, the Lord, when he came to this earth, he had a mama. And he took her. So he doesn't discriminate. It's not because he's mean. That's, that's the way you're going to spend eternity with him. So you, you see that you got two parameters there. You got the time of life, of birth, and you have the time of death. Those things are set. And, and, and very rare do anybody go beyond that time. And we'll get to that in a little bit. When God has a specific date for you to leave this world, God has set a date. So let's say, for instance, Brother Bowden, I'm supposed to live to be 80 years old. That, that may be set in stone from the beginning. But in between the time I'm born and the time I leave here, I can shorten that through my own will. I can do that. And we're going to go over this. In fact, let's go. So what, what was the parameter we read just now? What was the lifespan? What was it? 120 years. So most of us know most people don't live to be that long. So something else must have, must have happened. Isn't that right? <laughs> let's go to the 90th chapter of the book of Psalms. We're going to start reading We're going to start we're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, "Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever though thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction and says, Return, ye children of men, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away with a flood. They are as a sleep in the morning. They are as a sleep in the morning. They are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withered. For we are consumed by thy anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all, for all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are what? Well, how many years is that? Seventy. One score is twenty years. So sin kept on increasing. And so the Lord said, okay, now you're going from 120 to 70. Everybody notice that's the average lifespan? God's not a liar. <laughs> Let's go and keep reading. 
It says, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. So that's the average lifespan now, 70 years. God have cut it to that point because of sin. So now we see the parameter the, for the day, three score and ten, 70 years. If you love, live beyond that, it's because God's grace and mercy has been extended towards you. You see that? But we're just talking about generally. Now, there are some people who it's God's will for them to live beyond that. You see that? But again, we got this parameter that God has set, and you could either lengthen it or, or you can shorten it. Very, very rare is it that God will extend somebody's life. Very rare. Beyond what he has called it to be. But we, we're the determining factor when it comes to shortening it. You see that? We're the determining factor in that. Let's go look at a man real quick who God showed mercy to. Let's go to the uh, 38th chapter of the book of Isaiah. And we're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. Is everybody there? The 38th chapter of the book of Isaiah? All right, verse 1. Brother Tanks? All right. I'm just messing with you. All right. The 38th chapter of the book of Isaiah, verse 1. It says, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus said the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt what? And not live. And he wasn't being mean about it. Let me, let me make this clear. Hezekiah was a righteous king. He was righteous. Now, you see how the Lord gave warning there? Set your house in order. Pay all your bills off. Make sure you get AT&T and all the rest of them paid off so <laughs> your relatives aren't trying to hold fish dinners when you leave here. That's, that was the gist of it. That's what he meant when he said, set your house in order. Get your business straight. He wasn't, so the prophet wasn't telling him that because he had done something wrong. The law was just telling him, your time is just about up, so start getting everything in order. Let me make this clear. It is not meant for death to sneak up on believers. It is not meant that, to be that way. It is not meant for death to sneak up on believers. I know men of God who left here who knew that they were about to leave. And then I know people who left here who God spoke through a man of God and said, you're about to leave. So it is not meant for death to sneak up on God's people. Everybody see that? Alright, so he says, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to, to Isaiah saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus said the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer and I have seen thy tears, behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years. So you see the grace of God there? Hezekiah was a righteous king, 
and God answered his prayer and extended his life by 15 years. Let me say this. When the Lord calls us home, there's a reason behind it. God could let you, if, if you're not satisfied with your life, God could let you live to be a thousand years. You still wouldn't be satisfied. You still find a, bunch of whole, a whole bunch of stuff that you haven't done yet that you want to do. Years ago, the, the Lord revealed to me that he, a lot of times, he takes people at the time he takes them because he don't want them to backslide and end up in hell for an eternity. If you're one of those people, you're jumping in and out, in and out, in and out. The devil's waiting on you to jump on his side so he can take your life. And the Lord is waiting on you to jump on his side before it's too late. And so sometimes God is merciful to take you before you have a chance to, to be lost forever. See, now, that's the danger of jumping in and out like that. That's the danger of not serving the Lord with your whole heart. Because now you shorten your life and you'll force God to take you before your time. And if you're really not careful, the devil will catch you when you're on his side. You may say, well, Brother Bowden, I don't believe that. I don't believe the devil can take life. But the Bible makes it clear. He can take life. And if you're not living for him, if you're not living for the Lord, you have given him authority in your life. You see that? And you may say, well, Brother Bowden, I need to see that in the Word. So let's go to the book of Job. And speaking about Hezekiah, while you're turning to the book of Job, if you continue to read his life, those 15 years were, was a curse to him. He lived another 15 years, and the longer he lived, the more out of God's will he got. He got lifted up in pride. He began to show the very enemies of God all of the secret things in the, in the temple of God. And really, all they were doing was spying on him, and he allowed them to come in. And then God had to send another prophet to him and say, Hezekiah, who are these people? Oh, these are just folks I'm just showing, you know. And the Lord said, because you did that, I'm going to take your life. And your sons and your daughters, they're going to be led into captivity. You see that? And, and so there, there you see it there. <laughs> so the book of Job, let's, uh, chapter 1. We're going to start reading at verse 6. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and who was among them? Now, didn't I tell y'all, I think it may have been last week, Satan wasn't afraid of God? It's not like every time God come around, Satan is running. He wasn't afraid. He came. Now, can you imagine somebody coming into your house, robbing you at gunpoint, and, and then coming back later on to sit down at the table and eat dinner with you? That shows you the audacity of Satan. He don't care about God's authority, and he definitely don't care about yours. Now, he has to obey God, but he's... He, he operates in the, in the realm that God allows him to operate in. Concerning your life. Your life. Let's go and keep reading. Verse 7, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down in it. You see what he's bold. And notice the conversation there. And, and you better believe they still hold in conversations. Uh, the Lord isn't living in the North Pole and the devil in the South Pole. They're around each other all the time. Talking about your life. 
and where you are spiritually. What, do, what did Peter tell us, the apostle? The devil walks around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Who he may devour. That word may, it is implied that he has to have permission. So when the sons of God, which means the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, Satan was right there. And God didn't say, get on out of here, Satan. I, I send you back to hell where you come from. Did he say that? He asked him, where, where have you been? And listen, although Satan is the father of lies, he, you know it don't do him any good to lie to God. So you think about that. Think about if you have children and somebody, somebody done robbed you and they come to your house to eat dinner with you. And then you ask them, where are you coming from? Where you been? And they say, well, I was just out looking for your children because I want, I want to take their life. That's what's being said here. Let me tell you something. You have to understand these things from God's infinite wisdom. The devil can't do no more to you than what you allow and what God allows. God does not want to have immature believers. So he allowed the enemy to be there. The only thing the devil can do is expose what's on the inside of you. And many of us as parents, we want to keep our children from every little thing. Don't, bet not nobody bully them. Bet not nobody do nothing. But God has allowed the biggest bully you'll ever know to roam the earth. Why? He's going to either chase you to God or get you to come to him. In reality, all the devil can do is make it plain who's really serving the Lord and who's not. That's the only thing he can do. The devil don't make you do anything. He just exposed what's already there. If you belong to the Lord, he can't bother you. In other words, he can't touch your salvation if you belong to the Lord. You wouldn't, you wouldn't appreciate light unless you had been in darkness. And, and you can't appreciate the salvation of God until you had to wrestle with the devil. You wouldn't know what it was to be saved if there was no devil there to make you appreciate it. So no, God is not some unwise God that's just allowing the devil to roam around and beat up on his children. What did we just read in the book of Ecclesiastes? There's a purpose for everything. And so here comes this thief who have tried to overthrow God. Here he comes right back in the presence of God. And the Lord don't say, look, you got some nerve. He asks him, where have you been? And the devil tells the truth, walking up and down in the earth, to and fro in it. And of course, Peter, he really finishes, off, finishes it off, seeking whom he may devour. And look at what the Lord says, verse 8, And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job? Everybody see that? Here is God who's full of love, offering one of his children up to be bothered. Let's go ahead and keep reading. That there is none like him in the earth, a what? One that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God, fear God for naught? In other words, for nothing. Has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. Everybody see that? So in other words, what, Job, uh, what Satan is saying, if I were to check that out, and I see you have a hedge around him and around his house, and around everything that he does, his businesses, they prosper, I can't get to any of that. And so what Satan was saying was, that's the reason why he's serving you. You, you got him in this little love pillow. 
He don't know anything about hard times. And so don't ever think you can get so holy and so close to God that God won't extend you to Satan that same way. Right now, we, we have what we call the book of Job. Well, we can read it and we can see how Job was tested. And this book have encouraged, I imagine, millions of people. The purpose, of course, is this. The, there's this age-old question, why does God allow people to suffer? Why does God allow his own children to suffer? Very simple. If you read the book of Job, you'll know it. So that others can see how you can maintain, even in hard times, others can see your faith and be encouraged to walk by faith. That's why. There's your, your answer to that age-old question. God allows you to suffer so that others can see what you're going through so that they can be encouraged by what they see you going through. You know, uh, <laughs> we have a nephew now that's in basic training. He's going to be graduating here next week from basic training. And uh, he's in the Navy in the same place that I was in when I went to basic training. And I remember, <laughs> to me, basic training was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. And anybody that's ever been to basic training, you know what I'm talking about. That's a whole nother world, especially when you think you've grown. Because, of course, I graduated from high school when I was 17, and, and I thought I was grown. And nobody tell me nothing. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to be able to eat all the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches I want to eat. <laughs> You know how it is when you're little. You just got this favorite thing you want to. <laughs> so, my first day in the Navy, we got to Chicago, I guess about 1 o'clock in the morning at the airport. We got to the base, basic training, at about 2 o'clock. And we went to sleep about 2.30 or 3, and we were awoke the next day at 4 o'clock. Not by somebody saying, hey, uh, John, can you get up? Oh, get on up now. It's time to, you know, start your training. No, we were awakened by trash cans clanging together. Just the guy just marching up and down. Get up, you so-and-so, so-and-so. Get up. Like, wait a minute. Lord, I must be dreaming. That's what it felt like. And I remember we all got up and hurry up. We first had to remember, wait a minute, we done joined the military. So we got up and got to the end of our bunks and standing at attention. So my company commander, he goes to this guy across from me standing we're all standing at attention and he's standing there in front of this white guy you know like if you can imagine this is the nose his nose is right here in this guy's face and he says I don't ever want to hear any racial slurs I don't want to ever hear any, hear any of that he says because a black man may save your life and I was thinking that's that's good I'm glad that we are getting all this ironed out <laughs> And so then he comes to me, gets in my face, and says, and I don't want to see any of those, those five-minute handshakes either. <laughs> so that was a rude awakening. And I remember thinking, man, this is a whole different world. That was painful. This, you know, and, and it, it, it was painful until you realized what the game was. The idea, the whole idea of basic training was to break you down as an individual and build you back up as what they wanted you to be. In other words, they had to get rid of your attitude, your mindset, because all of that stuff, when you're in the battlefield, it'll get you killed and other people killed. All that individuality, it'll get you killed. So they had to tear you down as an individual, which is why they make you wear uniforms. 
And they build you back up as a team. You see that? And so it, it was rough. It was rough. And I remember these people, these guys that came into our barracks, and they were going to graduate within a few days. And they just all had this good look on their face like they were all happy. And we were thinking, why are they so happy? And then they began to talk to us. And they began to tell us, man, you know, you can, you can get through this. They say, we're about to graduate in a few days. And, you know, they begin to tell us some things. And they be basically begin to tell us how to think about basic training. If you think about it as a mind game, you'll be able to get past it. In other words, it's just something that's meant to build, to tear you down as an individual and build you up as a team. If you can, if you can think about that, it, that way and not take it so personal, you see that. And I'm telling you, to this day, I can remember how I felt seeing people who had gone through what I was going through. Now, you may, think, you may not think that's a big deal, but you just go to basic training, you'll understand what I'm saying. Seeing people who is about to graduate or who have gotten on the other side of it already, that was very, very encouraging. It made me think, I guess people do survive basic training. And that's the way the Lord is with his people. He allows you to go through things so that you can get on the other side and tell your testimony so that you can encourage other people so that they'll know, I guess people do survive. People really do survive this. You don't, this don't have to be the death of me. You see that? And that's, that's what, so here in verse, Eight, we see, and the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job? Everybody see that? So there was God offering Job up to Satan. Let's go ahead and keep reading. It says, And uh, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, that means hate evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? So I want you to see part of what made God, what made Job perfect and upright was he feared God and what else did he do? No, he was tolerant of it. You can't fear God and, and, and not hate evil at the same time. Those two go hand in hand. Now, we're saying this concerning some of the junk that just got passed in, in, in this country. You cannot fear God and not hate evil. It don't say, I don't, I don't have no opinion about it. Job is an upright man because he don't have any opinion about evil. He feared God and he did what to evil? All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. Then verse 9 says, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught, in other words, nothing? Has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he had on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. In other words... What Satan is saying is the only reason why he's serving you is because of everything you've done for him. You already got this hedge around him where I can't get to him. He says, but if you take all that from him, he'll curse you to your face. And so the question is for you, can you serve the Lord, whether you are poor or rich? Can you serve the God in, in good times and in bad times? Or is, are you only praising him when everything is going well? The Bible tells us in the 34th number of Psalms, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but out of them all, God delivers them. Many are the afflictions. Many. Verse 12, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy what? What kind of God is he? He don't sound like the God of love to me. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. He had got what he wanted. 
And of course, you know the test that took place there. Satan tried him, and, and Job still didn't curse God to his face. You see that? All right, so now let's go to the second chapter of the book of Job. We'll start reading at verse 1. It says, Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And who came also among them? Who? That devil just don't give up, does he? To present himself before the Lord. Verse 2, And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. What was he doing? Just sightseeing? He was looking for somebody who was off of their game. Looking for somebody who hadn't prayed that morning. Looking for somebody who was lifted up in pride. Looking for somebody who was not abiding and trusting in God's word. That's what he was looking for. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 3, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. I mean, no matter how righteous you are, you're still going to have trouble. Let's go and keep reading. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yeah, and all that a man hath, he will give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. Everybody see that? In other words, think about it. Satan had killed his children. Took everything that Job had, except his wife. And even got in his wife's mouth and tried to get his wife to talk him into cursing God so that he could die. And Satan and, and Job still held on to his integrity. So then Satan comes back with another plan. Yeah, yeah, he didn't curse you the first time, but you let me get a hold of that flesh. He, he'll, he'll do it then. Now, do, do you see the tenacity of Satan? If he can't get you one way, he's going to try another way. That's why the Bible tells us to put on the whole armor of God. If you just have your helmet on, he'll, he'll aim at your heart. And if you just have your breastplate on, he'll aim at your head. You got to have it all on. Verse 6, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but do what? Why did he tell him that if he didn't have the power to take it? Now, who was it that just, this statement here, who was it that put that hedge around Job's life? God did. Why was that hedge there? Because Job was a righteous man. I don't think folks know how much trouble they are in when they're walking contrary to the word of God. There are one or two reasons why you're still living outside of God's will. One, Either God is just being very merciful to you and he's giving you another chance or two, the devil's not done using you yet. You see that? And so we see here, Satan had the power but God told him don't do that. I'm not going to allow you to do that. And I'm going to tell you, you ain't got to be what you call the biggest sinner out there for, to, to be in, in trouble like that. If you will read the 13th chapter of the book of 1 Kings, there you will see a prophet of God who was called to testify against the, the altar of Baal that they had set up. And before he got there, God had instructed him, don't go the same way that you came, and don't go in anybody's house and eat. 
So he went there and he began to prophesy against this altar while these people were standing there offering sacrifices. The, the picture, in today's terms, what he would have done was went to church and while people were in there praising and worshiping, he would have begun prophesying against them. And so it just so happened that the king was there at that time. And while he was prophesying, the king spoke up and, and, and basically s told people to lay hands on him, not to let him, you know, not to let him continue to do that. And the king stretched forth his hand, and when the king did that, his hand became stiff, where he couldn't put it back in. So then he saw the power of God. And so then the king knew, okay, this must be God. And so then the prophet prayed for him, and the Lord healed him. So then the king told him, well, you know, you, you're a great man of God. Won't you come back and, and eat with me? And he told the king, no, I can't do that. The Lord told me not to go back with anybody, not to eat in anybody's house, just to con and not to go back the same way that I came. So then he went on about his way, and there was another, the Bible calls him an older prophet, whose sons had told him about this great man of God. And, and by the way, this prophet, this young prophet, had prophesied and said that the days will come where God will raise up a man named Josiah who, who will kill the priests and will strike down this altar. That was about 150 years before Josiah was born. This prophet called Josiah by name. So he was a great man of God. And so here comes a, a younger, a older prophet whose sons had told him about what had just happened. So this older prophet got on his, on his animal and went riding looking for this younger prophet. And he found him sitting under a, under a tree. And he said, are you the man of God that, that I just heard about? It? Yeah. He said, well, I want you to come back to my house. Let's talk and fellowship. That young prophet told him, well, the Lord told me not to go back with anybody, not to eat with anybody, and not to go back the way that I came. And this older prophet said, well, I'm a prophet just like you. And the Lord spoke to me and said, it's okay. You can. The Lord sent me here to tell you it's okay for you to come and eat with me. So the younger prophet went back home with the older prophet. And while he was sitting at the table of this older prophet eating, the older prophet really received the spirit of prophecy from God and began to tell him, because you disobeyed the word of the Lord, when you leave out of my house, a lion is going to meet you and kill you. Now, if it had been me, I'd still be sitting there. <laughs> You'd have just been seeing some bones right there. I'd have said, right, well, you know, if that's the case... Uh, where am I sleeping at? <laughs> what y'all got in here to, you know, for some blankets? <laughs> but some kind of way, he left. And when he left... There was a lion standing outside, and the Bible says that lion killed him. Didn't even eat him. It just killed him. And then the older prophet went outside, him and his son picked up that body and went and buried him. It was not meant for that man of God to die that way. But what brought about that death? Again, we got parameters. What brought about that death? He didn't do the worst thing in the world. Everybody understand? What we think is the worst thing. So let's make that clear. All you have to do is be outside of God's will. And you can be going to church and be outside of God's will. Just be outside of God's will. Outside of God's will is where the devil operates. Be outside of that will. You see that? And, and so... We see those parameters there. The devil have to respect the will of God on your life. That's the only thing he has to respect. The will of God on your life. 
and you doing that will. And let me explain how serious this is, you see. Uh, when I was 11 years old, I went into a coma for no apparent reason. And about a week later, I came out of that coma with an urge to preach. Now, I had always knew that I was called to preach, just like I knew my name. It was just something that I guess the Lord had programmed in, in me. Well, I always knew that I was supposed to do that. But at this time, I, I knew to take it serious. And so, um, you see, it was 1987, so I was 12 at the time. After I came out of that coma, uh, fear had came over me where I was very, 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 very sure, and I can still remember how I felt. I was very sure. Now, this is 12. I'm 12. I was very sure that when I went to sleep, I wasn't going to wake up. I knew, uh, you, and still today, you can't convince me of that. I knew without a shadow of a doubt that when I went to sleep, that was my last night on earth. So much so. Now, I have to keep telling you I was 12. This isn't something that 12-year-olds just walk around thinking about. 12 years old, I knew that that was my last night on earth, so much so that I was trying to keep my siblings up to play because I understood. This is, I didn't tell them that, but I understood this is my last night. And I can remember when they all dozing off to sleep. I, I can remember Mama was already asleep. And I went in our room and kissed her on the cheek and laid down. And I laid down looking up at the ceiling and I prayed, Lord, if you'll let me live, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And on to sleep I went, not knowing if I was going to wake up. I guess I just made peace that that was going to be my last night. That was very clear to me. And so that night I had a dream that I was standing in the pulpit and I was looking down just like this looking at the Bible and then I looked up at the people and then the Lord spoke to me and said don't be afraid and then after he said that I woke up and I sat up in my bed and he continued to tell me because I'm with you and that was him speaking to me telling me now, I already knew it, but that was just him commissioning me. So when you hear me say, I was commissioned to preach at the age of 12, that was my commission. Don't be afraid, because I'm with you. At the age of 12, you know, and I told you before, my, my great aunt used to always tell me, you know, when I was before them, when I was six, seven, eight years old, you better do what God tells you to do. Now, to me, I always thought, now, that's kind of mean. I want to play. I'm still a child. Let me grow up first. I hated to see her coming because she was going to always pull me to the side by my collar. You come here. Come here. Got me all pinned up in the corner. You better do what the Lord tell you to do. And I remember one time I just had a little answer prepared for her. She pulled me over one time and said that. You better do what the Lord tell you to do. And I thought in my mind, yeah, I'll do it when I get old. When I done done, when I'm done doing all the sin I want to do, all living it up, I'll, I'll preach then. Now that's, of course, I didn't say that to her. I'm thinking that in my mind. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it when I get old. I can't do anything else. Then I'll preach. And then the Lord spoke through her mouth and said, and don't think you're going to wait until you get old. She said, because the Lord can fix it where he'll take your mind from you and you won't even have a mind to come to him. So, okay, Lord, you see, that was young. So what I'm telling you, the devil was seeking for my life at a young age. And so those of you that have children, don't think for one minute the devil isn't on the hunt for yours. For your life and for your children's life. That's why we have to make sure we are in the will of God. Years ago, I was stationed in California, in San Diego. And, and you know, being stationed there, in San Diego, I lived in a bad part of the neighborhood. And really, it was because I was bad, too. 
I, you know, that the gangs were really bad there. And I lived in a, in, a, in a neighborhood where there was none but Crips, and I wore red. Not because I was a part of any gang. I just liked the color red. <laughs> and I had them pull me over and tell me, hey, you better take that off. You know, I'm telling you, when you're not living for the Lord, you don't care about your life. I told you what my motto was, death before dishonor. You disrespect me, we'll fight. I couldn't stand that. Yeah, and I was the type, you know, and that was what I was taught growing up. If you don't whoop a man, make him not ever want to fight you again. You see that? That was my motto. When you, by the time you got done fighting me, you were good and tired. You were ready for a nap. <laughs> so that was my mindset. It was a slow suicide. That's the best way I can put it. Either I was going to kill somebody or somebody was going to kill me. Now, I wasn't out looking for trouble, but if you wanted it, uh, you could have it. <laughs> and so, in this neighborhood, it was nothing for me to be walking down the street, see children playing, riding on their bikes, and, and riding in a circle. And in the middle of this circle is somebody's blood who had just been shot and killed. Children growing up seeing that, just, that was the first time I, I went to a middle school there, uh, had to walk through a, a metal detection. Never saw that before in my life. Children having to walk through a metal detector to go to school, to go learn. You see that? And so I'm just sharing this, this mindset with you of what was there. And I knew if I ever got married, I did not want to raise my children there. In, in a place like that, I'll put it that way. And so one night, I'm sitting out hanging with all, now, most of my friends out there were gang members. I wasn't in a gang, I, you know. It was just, I guess, I, I didn't discriminate against people. Just because you had a color on that didn't mean I didn't like you. I wasn't that type of person. If I liked you, I liked you. It didn't matter what, who you thought you were or how bad you thought you were, you know. I would be friends with you if you were friendly, you see. And so one night I'm sitting out, standing out by these cars with some of my friends, and we're all leaning against this car. And then we're in this big parking lot, if you can imagine that. Imagine a big parking lot. It's got a row of cars here on one side of it, and then in the very back there's another row of cars sitting off in the dark. So we're all, most of us, standing out talking to one another. And uh, this big guy... I guess they look like they were Samoans. This one guy standing on the side of me, he was very tall and very big. Just standing there talking with us. I guess he lived in, in the same apartment complex. And I, I know it now, I didn't know it then, but his brother had walked and stood directly in front of him. And I didn't know what was going to take place. I'm standing right on the side of him. And, uh, you know, he just walks and just stands right in front of him. And the guy just continued to talk to me and a couple other guys that's on the side of me. And just all of a sudden, his brother just hauls off and hit him. And he slides to the side and, and falls and snoring before he hit the ground. His brother had knocked him out. And then his brother walked up by his head, kicked him in the head, and he sat up and his brother punched him and knocked him out again. So I'm standing there just thinking... And this is crazy. So then I turn around and I look, and all the guys who were on the side of me, it was about 10 or 12 of them, they take their guns out of their pockets. Now, I never had a gun like that. They take their guns out of their pockets and put it in the small of their back like this. And they all, with one accord, begin to walk back to these vehicles that are sitting in the dark on the other side of the parking lot. And when they get to the vehicles, in the back, by the parking lot, I hear this clicking noise. The people in the, in the cars in the back of the parking lot slide clips into these guns. And then they all, with one car, begin to walk forward. And it was one of those moments, I don't know if you've ever had this moment, where you think, I'm in the wrong place. I ain't supposed to be here. What time is Bible study? <laughs> It was one of those moments where I'm thinking, man, 
I can get killed. These people ain't playing these streets. <laughs> that was one of my wake up calls where I knew I'm out of the will of God. And at any moment, my life can be taken. It don't mean I got right, right then. But I tell you what, I started thinking about my calling. And Lord, I need to get serious with you. Because you know when you're out there, you think, oh, I'm going to live however long the Lord allowed me to live. I'm going to be here until the Lord say so. Not knowing outside of God's will, we're shortening our life. You see that? Well, we can shorten our lives being outside of God's will. You see that? And of course, that's not God's will. God wants us to live as long as he has intended for us to live, to do his work. You know, I'm going to tell you this, and then we'll close. One of the biggest regrets that I have as a Christian is that I didn't make up my mind to serve the Lord sooner. I started, I'm 40 years old now. The Lord, as I told you, the Lord commissioned me when I was 12. I didn't answer that commission until I was 20. And so years passed with me playing. Years passed with me being outside of God's will and God's grace having to follow me. Now, it doesn't do that for everybody. You see that? Everybody don't get that same amount of grace. Some people get more, some people get less. Some people don't get any. When it comes to life, you see that. But, but I regret not serving the Lord sooner. Here it was, the devil had me thinking that I was missing out on something. I tell you, when it's all said and done, outside of God's will, you're just setting yourself up for more heartache, or for more hurt, more brokenness. You, you're just making a bigger mess for the Lord to clean up when you do decide to come to Him. You see that? And, and so God don't want you, every breath you take belong to Him. My prayer is that you'll use it wisely. You see that? That's God's desire for you. Live for Him. I'm telling you, if you knew the joy that comes with that, and I, let me make this clear, serving Him with your whole heart, with everything that's on the inside of you, that's the way God wants you to serve him. That's what he commanded Moses to tell the children of Israel. To love the, God, the Lord thy God with all thy heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Love him with everything on the inside of you. That's what God wants from you. And you know what? It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It doesn't matter what you did this morning or a few hours ago. You can make up your mind right now. From this day forward, I'm going to serve the Lord with everything on the inside of me. It doesn't matter what traps I fell for yesterday. Devil, today I'm serving the Lord. It's just that easy. I was just telling a brother the other day, you know, you don't have to be worried about what you did yesterday. Because when I made up my mind to serve the Lord, I was, and, and to, to do what he called me to do, I was AWOL from the military. And just one day I woke up and I said, Lord, from this day forward, I belong to you. I had made a mess out of my life. And I'm going to tell you, when you are not committed to the Lord with your whole heart, you're going to make bad decisions. And one day you'll wake up in those bad decisions. You'll be just like the prodigal son. The Bible says he came to himself. Why did he come to himself? Because at one point, the devil had got him to the place where he was not himself. He had the, the Lord had to show him who he used to be. And that's when he began to do a self-check. You know, why am I eating with the swine? You think about it. To, to Jews, the swine is a filthy animal. Why am I eating with swine? 
when I was at my father's house, I had this, I had that, I had servants. And I'm telling you, that's the way a, a lot of people are. They go out there looking for something that's not there. And, and before you know it, the devil has taken you way off somewhere to where you've forgotten who you were. Then one day, the Lord in his mercy will show you, you see that? You see who you used to be? This is not you. This ain't, this is not you. Years ago, I was talking to a woman of God, and she was telling me her salvation story. And she said that at one point, one time she was a stripper, and she was strung out on drugs as well. Was an alcoholic and all of that. And she said one day, I guess she had just got done stripping, or, and she was waiting on her next set, I guess is what they call it. And she was sitting at the bar trying to get drunk and trying to get high out of her mind so that she could strip. And she said while she was doing that, the Lord spoke to her and said, Woman of God, what are you doing in here? She wasn't thinking about serving the Lord. But you see how faith talks? You see how love talks? Love said, Woman of God, what are you doing in here? And that's the way God is. He'll say, woman or man of God, you know I've called you to a higher place. So let me make this play to some of you who may be applauding this decision that have been made by the Supreme Court. Although it may be your right now to live outside of God's will and marry somebody of the same sex, God is still calling to you telling you, I didn't create you to be that way. It may be acceptable by your peers, even by your government, but I have called you to a higher place. Your own body, the way I made it, is testifying against you when you lay up with somebody of the same sex. I didn't call you to do that. You see that? And, and that's the way God is with us. He extends our love to us. Not so that we can continue in sin, but so that we can come out of it and live right before the Lord. I'm telling you, it is such a pleasure, and God wants to be in that place when we can go before him with a clear conscience, knowing in our hearts that we're completely sold out to him. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, now let us come boldly before the throne of grace. How do you come boldly before the throne of grace? Except you have brought it all to God and you have told the Lord, Lord, I'm a mess. I need to be cleaned up. I need to be helped. Because if you don't help me, I'm lost forever. I'm telling you, when you get to that place, then God can help you. Then God can help you. Amen. Did you have anything? All right. Does anyone have anything they want to say or question or comments before we close? Amen. All right. So we're just grateful for the Lord for this message. Understanding death and how the Lord wants us to understand it. And let me say this, you know, when I dedicated and told the Lord I would serve him, when I told the Lord that, that I would preach for him, I was saying that, I was just sharing this with some of my family the other day, that I had a nose earring, three earrings in one ear, two earrings in another ear, and things like that. So I didn't look like a preacher. Now, when I was saying that, you know, it came to me to take all that stuff out of my face. And that's what I did, you see. So what I'm saying is, when I said to the Lord, I'm your preacher from here on out, that's the way it was. And he began to mold me and shape me for what it was he was calling me to do. It wasn't something that I had to, be, had to prepare for. Everybody understand? It, it, the, the first step was me telling the Lord, I belong to you from here on out. I'm going to do what you tell me to do from here on out. And that's the way it was. I spoke it with my mouth, and I believed it in my heart. 
And before that night was over with, the Lord had me preaching to somebody. You see that? And, and so that's what the Lord wants you to know. It don't take six months to get right with the Lord. Righteousness is by faith. Righteousness is by faith. So you accept your righteousness by faith. Because if you wait until all your problems have been solved and all of these, and until you've been healed, uh, you, you'll stay gone. Righteousness is by faith. You accept the law's grace. You see that? You accept the law's grace. Why? I, I want you to live as long as the Lord wants you to have ordained for you to live. And in your life, God wants you to do everything that he's called you to do. He wants you to reach everybody that he's called you to reach. Again, there are some people that you'll be able to reach that I won't ever be able to reach. There are some people that's in your circle that's not in my circle. There are some people that's waiting on you to get right with the Lord. And then they'll follow suit. You see that? Some people, somebody's waiting on you. You see that? And so the Lord wants us to think about it that way. Amen. So let's, let's, let's live with our whole hearts for the Lord. Let's, let's not play with them. And I'm telling you why you think you're playing with them. The devil is plotting and planning your demise. The devil's, let me make this clear. The devil's trying to kill you. He's still walking to and fro. Still walking up and down in the earth. He's trying to kill you. The question is, are you going to give him permission to? Amen. All right. If nobody else have anything else to say, I feel like I'm not supposed to close, so just uh, let's, let's pray for a second. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your word going forth, Lord. And we pray that it has reached the people that you've wanted it to reach and that it will reach those who will watch or listen to this in the future. God, I pray that whoever's heart you're talking to, whether they're sitting here, whether they're listening in or watching us in the future, God, I pray that you will touch their hearts to turn their lives to live completely, to be sold out completely to you, Lord. Lord, you've extended your mercy to all of us. And Lord, I pray that they will receive your salvation, that they will receive your grace by faith, Lord. That they will receive it knowing that you are merciful. And that you are calling out to them, Lord, to turn, to come to you, and to live for you with their whole hearts. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. Thank you, Lord, for saving us, for changing us. We know, Lord, that it's not anything that we've done. We know, Lord, that it's only by your grace and your mercy that we are still alive, that we're still here, that we're stay, still able to talk, to walk, to breathe, to have a mind to come before you. And we thank you so much, Lord, and we pray that whoever you're talking to, Lord, whoever they may be, will receive that same grace and that same mercy. We thank you so much, Lord. All we can do is thank you for what you've done for us, for sending your son to die for us. Before we even knew ourselves, Lord, you, you had a plan of salvation for us. And we thank you for that salvation. Thank you for saving us. Thank you, Lord, so much. You're so, mo so merciful to us, so gracious to us, Lord. Y'all just stand up, please. Let's begin to praise the Lord. Just talk to the Lord with your mouths. Thank you so much, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for everything, God. And God, we pray that you will continue to help us to remain in your word. Help us, Lord, to continue to follow your word, to have a made-up mind to serve you. Lord, if there's anything in our lives that's not pleasing to you, we ask that you will help us to see it, Lord. Help us not to continue to walk down the wrong road if we go down the wrong road. But, Lord, we ask that you will give us warning whenever we may turn to the left or to the right. Help us, Lord, to stay on the straight and narrow that you've called us to walk on. 
Lord, we pray for your people who may be out of your will, those that may have left you, God. We pray that you will help them to return to you with their whole hearts, Lord. We ask that you will continue to extend mercy to them, Lord. Be merciful to them as you've been merciful to us, Lord. We've all been down that road where we thought we knew more. We thought that we had it all together. But, Lord, we've given our lives to you. We know that you know more, Lord. We give it all to you, and we ask, Lord, that you will extend the same mercy to them as you've extended to us. Help us also, Lord, to be lights in this dark world, to continue to live the life that you've called us to live, Lord, so that others can see our good works and glorify you. Thank you so, Lord, so much, Lord, for placing your good works on the inside of us. Thank you for giving us a mind to produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Is there anyone else that have anything to say? We want to just continue to encourage you all to continue to lift up uh, the Evans family. To and if you all remember what we've uh, we've committed, uh, we you know ourselves to fast and pray for them. And we've all picked a day to fast and pray a particular uh, meal. And so we want to ask you all to you know continue with that. And uh, have anybody seen any results in their lives since this? Amen. All right, so we want to ask you all to continue to fast and pray for this family, you know, that God will restore this marriage, restore the husband as well, and also, you know, con to continue to pray for the, uh, one of the daughters, the cataract that's in her, both of her eyes, that the Lord will heal her. You see, that the Lord will, that the Lord will do it. Amen. All right, if that being all now, you're now dismissed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.